Are y'all excited to be in the house of God today? Uh, I know we're talking about something that's not usually talked about in the house of God, but it's still the house of God. Come on. Are you grateful for our worship team? Can you put your hands together for E2 worship? Man, every single Sunday, just so anointed, so powerful. I love this church. I love you. Some of them don't even know who we are yet, but if it's your first time, can you wave at me real quick? First time guest, can we give it up for our VIPs? We're so glad you're here today. Thanks for joining us. I know you're like nervous to put your hand up. We're not going to call you up to the front. I used to go to a church like that. If you were a first timer, we'd call you up to the front. I've never experienced that before, but it does not sound It's super awkward. Like not the thing you want to do if you're your first time there. Right. Well, my husband and I, I'm Trent, by the way. I'm Pastor Jared. And we want to welcome you all to our close out of our series called Love Fight. Let's Have you guys go. been enjoying it? Yes. It's been good. Over the past few weeks, we've gone through a few different topics from a godly relationship, mm-hmm. fighting for a godly relationship, fighting for good communication, for a unified vision, fighting for good community. And today we are closing it out with a big bang, <laughs> fighting for good sex. Okay. I just came up with that on the spot, guys. You should be proud. A lot of, lot of moments like that today. Okay, how many of you, you grew up in a church where you talked about sex on Sunday at church? Literally nobody. I grew up not even talking about it. In I was going to say you're Catholic. They didn't talk about this we in the Catholic never, church. Never, ever, ever. No, That's, that wasn't a normal topic of conversation. <laughs> we didn't talk about it in my church either. I will say we did have a few like special conferences here and there. They were always kind of awkward. Um, but the reason why we want to talk about this today is because of that very reason. The fact that nobody in this room can say they grew up a part of a church that had healthy, biblical, godly conversations around sex. Y'all, God created this thing, okay? It's a good thing. It's supposed to be enjoyed. And yet, we, because we as a church have not had open conversations around this, everyone has to go somewhere else to find answers. And we wonder why our relationships and our marriages are just like the world. They're unhealthy. They're dysfunctional. We don't have answers to these questions. And so that's our desire today. We are not sex experts. Okay? We, we, we don't have all the knowledge, um, but we do know the Bible. And we want to create a space where we can at least have a conversation around what this looks like in a healthy Christian marriage. And so in order to do that, we obviously have to start with Scripture. And there's a foundation for everything that we're talking about here today. Genesis 2, 24 is our main scripture today, and it's, it reads, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The foundation for this conversation is that good sex exists within the covenant of marriage. And it says one flesh there. But that's not just the physical aspect of it. There is a spiritual, emotional bonding that happens within the covenant of marriage. And you think that as Christians, we'd all agree on that. But even like when I scroll online, one of our, one of our relationship videos went viral this week. And so when something goes viral, you get lots of a crazy lot of comments. Feedback. A lot yes. of feedback. And so it's kind of like a form of entertainment to just scroll through some of those comments. And some of the ideas we've got. You can got, call it entertainment. I don't think it's for me very entertaining. Some of the comments are entertaining. I had somebody that was like, well, David and Solomon had like a thousand wives. Is, is, is that's in the Bible. Is that, can we do that? And so it, let's just set the record straight. There are a lot of things that happen in life, in your life, in the lives of the people in the Bible. Just because God allows certain things doesn't mean that he approves everything, right? And so we just got to understand that there is a biblical foundation for this. And so today, as we talk about healthy sex, it is going to be a heavy bias on the married couples here today. For those of you who are married, this is definitely for you. If you're here and you're single, this is something to look forward to in your marriage. Um, But the cool thing is that you are still within a season in your life where you get to make that decision as to who you're going to spend the rest of your life with. You get to decide, am I with somebody that is worth spending the rest of my life with? Is this person, do they share my values? And I just want you to know, uh, you should be having these conversations before you get to that engagement. If the person that you're with doesn't agree on these biblical foundations and values, you probably should move on from that relationship because ultimately it's not going to go in the direction that God has planned and purpose for you. But this is a great place, E2 Church, to find 
somebody. Your boo at E2. Find your boo at E2. Come on, find your boo. We're, had another E2 wedding yesterday. We did. We are a product of That's the E2. That's right. A number of couples I see in the audience are actually find your boo at E2 so listen, stories. <laughs> get into a group, find somebody. This is a good place to do it, okay? Are y'all ready to jump in? All right, so today we're going to be answering some questions. We've got a list of questions that we want to talk about. Questions that we've asked in our marriage, questions that a lot of Christian couples that we talk to ask, and things that are kind of a wide consensus of. I'd like to know some insight about this. So the first First question, pretty general. What makes for great sex? Is it the mood music? Is it when I do that sexy little dance that you hey, like so oh, much? Oh, we decided we weren't going to enact or act out anything. We're not doing it? Okay, yes. We're not so going to do that. Let's not show off a little bit too much okay. of that. Okay. Yes. All right. What makes uh, great sex? The answer I have for you is connection. It is connection. When we look at scripture earlier and it talks about two becoming one flesh, it is so much more. Sex is so much more than just the physical deed. Mm. It is a true connection, a bond that is emotional, that is spiritual. Yeah. And so when we talk about what good sex looks like, it is connecting with your partner on the deepest level. You know, intimacy is the act of being intimate. And when you Google search or look up the word intimate in, diction, in the dictionary, it means to dive deeper. It is something private. It is something personal. And so when we think about a healthy marriage and looking for great intimacy, great sex, it looks like being the most intimate with your partner possible. And intimacy is more than just two bodies coming together. It's two hearts coming together. It's really good. It's two minds coming together. It's your souls coming together. It's loving each other in the deepest way possible. And a lot of times that actually happens before you even get into the bedroom. That's right. It happens in the morning when you're checking in on each other. It happens the day before. It happens the week that, that you're starting. Do you care about the same things that your spouse is caring about? Because when you're building and feeding into that connection of celebrating the things that your spouse is celebrating, having sorrow for the moments mm. that your spouse is struggling through, that's what builds up to the most incredible intimacy. Yeah, I think we're going to talk about chemistry in a little bit, but I think that the world kind of portrays this idea of good sex as just the, the, the enjoyment of the physical act, that one moment. Is that really good? Is that really pleasurable? But there's so much that factors into that moment. That moment is the overflow of everything else that's been happening throughout that day, throughout the relationship. And some of us were wondering why the sex isn't great. And my question is, how's everything else? Did you chew each other out all day and then you're wanting to have this incredible orgasm at night? That's just not going to work that way. If, if all day I have memories of us fighting, arguing, bickering, or, or we're not meeting each other where we're at, we're just rushing into the sexual moment, for that to try to solve all of our problems, we are neglecting something even bigger. What's, what's more important is that we're connected on an emotional level, that we have conversation, that we're investing into the marriage, into the relationship so that when we get to that moment of physicality, all of those memories, I say, you bring that history into the bedroom with you. Is the history that you're bringing in either absence emotionally or, or negative experiences? Or is it, man, I remembered when you asked me how I was doing this morning. Or I remember when you took out the trash today. Or I remember when you cared for the kids and I was overwhelmed. That history is a turn on and makes the sexual experience that more enjoyable. So good. Somebody believes in that. First Peter 3, 8, it says, and, and even within this scripture, before we even say it, Peter was, before this like verse, Peter was addressing the wives and the husbands on how they are to be, how to love one another, what to do as wives, what to do as husbands. And then finally, in verse 8, it says, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be mm. compassionate and humble. The fact is, if you want to have great sex, get on the same page. Yeah commit to caring for one another, loving one another, and that can lead towards it. Yeah, connection makes great sex. Care makes great sex. So care is this idea of serving one another. Can I tell you, serving is the sexiest hey, trait hey, that you can talk have. talk about that. Come on, when you are focused on serving your spouse, I'm telling you, I didn't say servicing your spouse. I said <laughs> serving, okay? When you're it's focused- all the same. <laughs> wow. When your focus is serving on each other or pleasing the other person, pleasure is never a problem. 
When we're selfish and self-centered, then pleasure becomes a problem, right? Who's going to get what they need? Look at 1 Corinthians 7, 2 through 5. It says, because there's so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. The husband, what, let me just give you context here. What Paul is saying here is that marriage obviously is God's solution to your sexual needs. You have sexual needs and desires. And so God created a solution for that. Get into a covenant with somebody. If you just go out and just have sex with whoever, you are now opening yourself up, your mind, soul, spirit, to whoever you're going to build a soul tie with and connect with. And now it's unprotected because you are not guarded by covenant. So God builds in this dynamic to not just keep you protected, but also keep you accountable. You, are, you, you got to stay with the person that you engage with sexually. And so it says, uh, the husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs, and the wife should fulfill her husband's sexual needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband, and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations. A lot of people love that one part of the scripture. Unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. I really want to know who those people are. Can you imagine that, that conversation? That. Like, hey, we should just stop. Let's and not pray. do it tonight. I want to pray. <laughs> we can pray and do it. I mean, we can multitask here. Come on. Then it says this, after you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. This context here, what Paul's saying is, is that your, wife, your body now belongs to your spouse. So when you're single, your body belongs to the Lord. And when you're married, your body now is given over to your spouse. In other words, your spouse is in charge of your orgasm. Now, that's a very vulnerable spot to be in, right? That's a very exposed, out of control place. And it requires a lot of trust in that other person to steward and take care of that. If our mentality and our focus is servanthood and serving one another, then that won't be a problem. Because my job, my duty, my responsibility is to make sure your needs are being met, that you're enjoying this, that you're not put into a place of temptation, right? That I don't, I don't, put you into a spot in life to now where you are struggling with, man, I'm, I am so desiring. Now I'm looking at things or I'm lusting after someone else. No, I want to make sure that I tend to you, that I take care of your needs. But if I'm focused on myself, then it's only about my needs. When we outserve one another, that's what makes great sex is that my, I'm focused on pleasing you. You're focused on pleasing me. Now it becomes a competition. Who can please each other? I'm telling you, that's, that's a good day right there. That's going to be a really good experience. Now, now, when we talk about this scripture, a lot of Christians can use that and hold that over their partner's head, right? Well, it's your duty. Okay, you're not a slave, but you are a servant. Doesn't mean that you're under this demand and you don't have any say and you can't be realistic. Come on, sometimes you, you, there are things that happen. Things come up. You can't do it every single time that you plan on doing it. But we really, we really fight in our marriage to not deny each other. Now, once again, there is a realistic dynamic that if there's something going on or if there's things that are, you know, it's not a conducive time or whatever, there's, there is grace and we're realistic with one another. But we really fight hard to create a space where that other person doesn't feel ashamed to have to go to the other person and say, hey, can we do this? That's, that's one major issue that we see in marriages is because that power has been held over the other person's head. Now they feel, they feel shame. They feel weird. They feel uncomfortable expressing their needs. They feel rejected. Mm -hmm, before and they even ask. That's right. And I think that that's why it's so important for us to both in a marriage for you to prioritize the fact that, okay, there needs to be a consistency. And we'll talk about that later as well. But there needs to be a, a decided upon like consistency. And it changes over seasons. It changes over time. Life happens. We get it. But overall, we're still fighting for the same thing ultimately. Yeah. Sometimes one is fighting more than the other. Okay, that's real. But at the same time, we both know that we have made a decision from the beginning. Yeah, and you just need to be 
be on the same page about what that looks like for each other. You know, for some of us, uh, what leads to that moment of great sex care doesn't look the same for our spouse. What it feels like for us, you know, for one of you, it may be physical touch. It may be a massage or it may be putting on the right music. For the other person, it may be chore play. Some of you, Wait, say that again. listen, some of you right now, your spouse is in desperate need of a chorgasm, okay? They, it's we long overdue. We have confused overdue. faces still. They're not, they're not getting it. It's long <laughs> overdue, y'all. Some of you, so, how many of you, you're an acts of service love language person? You're acts of service, okay? Okay, the people that are acts of service, some of them, they cannot relax and even think about getting into the mood because all these other things on the list have not That's been taken real, care of yet. Real talk. So you're trying to rush in to go make love, and it's like, hey, can you make the bed, or can you take out the trash, or can you put the kids down? Because they that that's chore play for them. You get it? Chores, foreplay. Y'all, y'all cracking. You're looking at me like you're not. Where are y'all get this? Okay. Today. Okay. So, so you got to learn your spouse's love language and meet them where they are. Because a lot of times we demand that they meet us where we are, but we don't meet them where they are. I think one that is important too is the visual aspect mm -hmm. of things. You know, for, I remember there was a season where I worked from home a lot. And I am the type of girl that does not get ready unless I need to get ready, okay? I get ready to go out on a, on a Sunday or whatever the case is, but on a regular day, I'm exposing myself. <laughs> on a regular day, I can stay in my pajamas all day. I can do it from morning to night and I would not have changed. I go out to the garden, I've got leaves in my hair and everything, and it is crazy. And I remember there was a time in our marriage where we kind of had to have that conversation, like, man, we need to kind of be intentional because what can, often like be in, in a lot of our situations is it looks like we are willing to get ready for other people when mm. we go out, but we're unwilling to get ready for our own spouses. Mm -hmm. That sucks. That sucks. Yeah. It's really important that we make sure that that person feels valued and important in whatever way uh, speaks to them because we all speak a different language. Uh, let's go on to this, the second question. All right. Second question is how important is sexual chemistry? So I love this one. Chemistry defined is the investigation of substances, how they react, combine, and the process towards forming new substances. And so a lot of times in our culture, we think of sexual chemistry as something that you discover. Oh man, we've got you know, try it before you buy it, right? So you got to, you know, figure out, does this work? Do we have chemistry? The reality is sexual chemistry is developed, not discovered. It doesn't just happen. And the reason why that's so important to know is because chemistry changes over time. You change. Your sexuality is going to change as you get older. Come on, as you go through different hormonal changes, as you have kids, as you experience different seasons in your life, this changes. And so if we just expect chemistry to be something that is discovered in one moment of sexual activity, we are really stopping short the journey of learning how to enjoy the process of growing together sexually. And so sexual chemistry is something you develop over time. In our culture and in our day and age, we've bought into this idea that if I'm attracted to it or if I feel it if right it's now, there, it's there. Yeah, if it's, it's just not, there. It sucks for you. And, and I think that attractions are indicators, but they're not dictators. Attractions change. Things change. And just because it feels a certain way right now doesn't mean that it's going to stay that way forever. And so when we commit to the process and the journey of, you know, especially for Christian couples, if you grew up in church and you abstain from sex and, you know, you get married, all of a sudden it's like an overnight change. You have to adjust a bunch mentally to just get into that spot. What happens is, is there's this almost let down disappointment because the first few times, few months, maybe even few years, it's a little wonky. Like it's weird. It's not, you haven't gotten into a rhythm yet and the, the sex doesn't feel amazing and you're trying to figure things out. And, and if you judge your journey in sex just in that one moment, you'll be discouraged. You'll avoid it. You won't want to go back to it, it because, well, oh man, it wasn't pleasurable or it was painful or it was awkward or it was uncomfortable. And it doesn't have to stay that way. It's not going to stay that way. But if you walk away from it because you judge the chemistry from one single act, then now you've really stopped short the journey of development. The reality is it's going to take work to make it work. 
I know you don't like hearing that because you watch movies and TV shows where a couple can have sex one time and it's like absolutely exhilarating and amazing, but that's not the real world. And sex does require work and effort and time and learning to be able to create great sex. Sex gets better the more you do it, but it takes work. And if you don't believe that it takes work, let me just tell you, you probably haven't had difficulty trying to conceive. But if you have, you realize it ain't just straightforward. It's not so easy. Sometimes it takes work. Sometimes you have to schedule it out. You have to plan it. We shared a little bit about our journey a few months ago, and we've been trying now for two years and still believing and trusting God that he's going to bless us with a child one day. But you know what? It takes work sometimes. I'd say that's probably the 1%, but there is seasons where it requires effort and communication and time. You got to, at this time of the month and this many times a day. And, and so I say that because this lie that sex does not require effort and work is really creating a wedge in your marriage because now you're blaming the other person or you're typecasting your relationship as it's just not going to be enjoyable. That's just what it is. So some of you, you're going to porn because you find an outlet there instead of your own marriage because you don't want to work at it. You'd rather not work, look at a screen and take control of your own life as opposed to work at the very relationship that God has blessed you with. I'm going in a little bit right now. You really are. And I think on the other side of things too, and it's not just the male that goes to porn or, you know, it, it doesn't work just one way. Right. It could be on the other side as well. I think the, the challenge there is when the spouse doesn't want to be a partner in that. Like we both have to work to, towards good sex, good sexual satisfaction together. Otherwise, like, why, why wouldn't you? Like, that's, that's what it's meant for. Your that's marriage right. is there to be able to provide that for you. And so I would just encourage those who feel like, man, you're kind of stuck right now, try. Just take that step. You know, in the spirit of um, talking about sexual chemistry, we might as well just go all in and say, embrace the experimentation right. then. Because it is experimenting and, and trying new things and um, breaking out of the routines or certain things positions or things that we do. Okay. I'm going to say it. Or being so serious, taking yourself right. so seriously. Sometimes not, don't laugh at the person during the actual sexual activity, but sometimes you need to step back and be able to just laugh and enjoy that Giggle, journey together. Yeah. Be like, that was weird. That didn't work so well. Thought that was, that was better in my head than it did, you know, in front of us. But you, you got to be able to go on that journey together. I think when we see each other as separate and especially men, we can see ourselves as performers, right? We got to show up. We got to perform. When you've got that pressure, you silo yourself and you separate yourself from the journey together of intimacy right. and saying, you know what? We're working this out. It's going to take a process, but we're going to get there. And it's more than just like the physical experimentation. I think there are ways to be able to improve your sex life um, that are about like researching, like studying yep. or, or listening to some Christian podcasts. There are Christian podcasts some really and great ones, teachings yeah. about how to have a great sex life. And so I would, I would really encourage you to just be proactive about it because you want that. You both want that in your marriage. Yeah. Okay, next question. How do Christians explore sexiness when the Bible so heavily emphasizes holiness? This was, this is the most passionate topic for me today. And the reason why is because as Christians, I, I feel like a lot of people find themselves in a place of trying to figure out the balance of being holy, yet also being sexy and attractive. And we struggle, especially the ones who have been in church all their lives and have been told, don't fall into temptation, don't go into, don't do too much, don't. But then also at the same time, we're asked, or not asked, but we're seeking for a partner in our lives. We're seeking to find that loved person. And so we want to be attractive. We want to be beautiful. And it's such a tricky dynamic to figure out in the midst of all of that, mm. the balance of church holiness and, and being attractive in this world. The world is telling us exactly what sexy looks like. And so then we're getting confused by what the world is telling us. And now, you know what happens? We get stuck in a place where we feel like we're not good enough. Mm. Ladies, like, man, you feel like you're not holy enough because you, you feel like you want to be beautiful and you feel like you want to be presentable in a certain way to attract, like, the, the opposite sex. And now you feel guilty mm. and shame before the Lord. 
Or maybe you're on the other side, you're a church girl, and now you've gotten married and you have no idea what it looks like to explore sexuality. You have no idea what it looks like to embrace being sexy because you're so, it's so foreign to you. And because the church hasn't talked about it, you're going to the world to figure it out. Mm. And no wonder, like we're all kind of messed up and we're all trying to figure out, okay, what does this actually look like? For the singles, it's a struggle, right? It's a struggle to be holy, yet at the same time, like, I wanna be beautiful. So what do we do? And the truth is, is that Bible, the Bible does talk about the fact that we are to be holy. First Peter 1, 15 to 16, it says, be holy because I am holy. Romans 12, one, it says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. We are meant to be holy, but then also God created us to be sexual beings. We are, right? We're, we enjoy touch, we enjoy love, and we're meant to because that's what we experience when we get married. And so how do we balance those two things while the world is telling us what to do? The first thing I wanna address is the desire to be sexy. And you know, in this world, I think it's very easy to be tempted to want to be sexy, to put ourselves out there, to be attractive to the opposite sex or to present ourselves in a certain way. And we can say, okay, it's not because I'm trying to get the attention of all these males, I just wanna be beautiful, but then it is a little bit tricky trying to figure out what that's supposed to look like. And the question I have for you is, who's your audience and why are you doing it? Who are you being sexy for and why are you trying to be sexy? Are you trying to cure loneliness? Mm. Are you doing it because you want someone in your life so badly? And that's where the tricky part is. Are you doing it because you're looking for love? Mm. The truth is, is that if you pursue it in that way of presenting yourself in a way that looks overly sexualized, that is presenting yourself to be out there in that way, that's not producing love, that's producing lust. Mm. And the challenge is that even when you find a spouse, even when you find a partner and you continue to pursue love in that way, what happens is that it's still gonna be unfulfilled once you actually do have a partner. That's right. You're still gonna desire attention. You're still gonna desire those needs to be met. And the truth is, as Christians, what we need to know is that the desire of loneliness to be cured, of love, can only come from Jesus. It can only come from the love of Jesus. That is the truth, and that's what we need to continually recognize, is that when you are trying to, when when you want that, satisfaction of feeling not alone, of feeling completely loved and embraced, that only comes from the love of God. Yeah, it's really I good. wanna take us to the scripture real quickly, John six thirty five. It says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And Psalm 107, nine, for he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. I I just wanna encourage you today that if you are feeling lonely and you struggle with what it looks like for holiness versus sexiness, find satisfaction in God first. Find satisfaction. And when it comes to the opposite side, those married folks who are now trying to figure out, okay, how do I be sexy? How do I do this? Because I I don't feel it, I don't know what to do with myself. Whatever the case is, the great thing is that scripture says, it's there, it's available for you. Hebrews 13, four, it says, marriage is honorable among all and the bed is undefiled. Undefiled means pure, it means holy. Mm -hmm. It means whatever happens in the bed, there's joy there that is available for you to do what you wanna do with your spouse. And that is something to be excited about. Yeah, Yeah, I think that that, that's so important. What I love about, something I really appreciate about you is that my wife is sexy. Okay? And I'm not saying that in like a little corny way. My wife is sexy, but y'all don't see that. That's for me. And when we talk about sexiness within the context of a marriage, there are sides of us and parts of us that are reserved exclusively for only each other. That is what, into, I know we live in a world where everything's broadcast now and everything's posted and everything's seen, but there is a life that we have that y'all don't know about, and it should stay that way. We are sexy for each other. And so there's, a, there's this idea that sexy and holy are opposite. That's not true. Sex is holy. 
God made it. He wants you to enjoy it. So it's not either or sexy versus holy. It's who sees it and who is it intended for. And so you want to be sexy for your spouse? Proverbs 5, 18, it says, May your fountain be blessed. May you rejoice in the wife of your youth. May her breast satisfy you always. Be satisfied with your spouse. Be sexy for one another. Invest in the excitement of your marriage, but let her breast satisfy you, not her breast satisfy you. What I mean is, who is defining sexy for you? Is it your spouse or is it a screen? This is something I'm really passionate about because a lot of times what happens is, we're going to go into this in the next question, is we project onto our partner something we picked up out there. What I never want my wife to feel like is that she ever has to compete with any other image of attraction in my life. She is the model. She is the standard. When it comes to what I am attracted to, what I desire, it is her and her alone. I'm not looking at something else. I'm not wishing for something else. And I'm not putting that standard of beauty on her because I picked up something out there that I'm putting on her in the bedroom. Sexy is defined by the person that you are with. Now, you have conversations about that. You talk about that. You work at that. That is a beautiful thing. But when we start pulling things from the outside in, that's when insecurity, questions, who am I being compared to? Am I his type? Am I her type? Is this what he's really into? You know what I'm really into? You. Whatever you've got to offer me, I'm into that. Because that's who I married. That's what I made my vows to. I'm into you. Period. Somebody say period. All right, let's go on to the next question. Is there a place for fantasies or kinks in Christian marriages? The 830 was mortified that I used that word in a sermon. <laughs> so something that I've been seeing a lot lately, like on TikTok and on social media, it's wild, is just what is being communicated to our kids and what is being taught to our children as normal sexuality. And there is this kind of growing trend that like vanilla sex, like that's lame. You know, it's, it's normal and exciting to have a kink, to have a, you know, something, something else that you add in to the sexual mix of your relationship. And when I was thinking about that this week, the question is, is what excites you sinful or wrong? And as I thought about that and I prayed about that and I really searched scripture in it, what excites you isn't necessarily sinful. The question I have is, where is its origin? Where did you pick that up? Where was it a past sexual experience? Was it something you've looked at online? Is it a movie you've watched? What you picked up in your past is that controlling now your present sexual relationship? In other words, if your kink excites you more than the connection in your relationship, then you don't actually want intimacy. You just want to have an orgasm. Fantasies or desires in themselves are not necessarily wrong, but you do have to evaluate where they come from. Because if I have this fantasy because of the porn I watched, and I've shared this, my experience with porn, I was exposed to it when I was seven years old, struggled with it all throughout my teenage years until I was 18, and I was delivered from that when I went to Bible college. But I was addicted to pornography, watched it for hours a day when I was a teenager. I was exposed to stuff I should never have seen at a very, very young formative age that defined what sex looked like for me. Therefore, my sexual expectations came from experiences and things that I watched that weren't real. Those fantasies and desires came from something that did not come from a marriage or from a relationship that God put in front of me. Therefore, you have to do some work in evaluating where does that stuff come from? Because if what happens is, if I start picking up that baggage and bringing that baggage into the bedroom and putting that on my partner, now this person is no longer the object of my affection or attraction, they have to put on whatever stuff I picked up in order to be a be, for me to be attracted to them. 
That is not godly. That is not honoring. And what that does is it drives a wedge in bitterness and resentment because they can't just be who they are. They can't just embrace their originality. And, and so if you're asking your partner to play a part, I don't believe you're safeguarding your sex life. Now, on the flip side of that, both of us had sexual histories coming into our marriage. We had things that we needed to talk about, things we needed to work through. Some of you, not only do you have sexual history, you come from SA or you've had trauma in your past. And so because of all of those things, you are now in a relationship where you need a safe place to be able to share that with one another. And there should be no shame and a place for condemnation or guilt within your relationship to be able to share and express your past with that person. You want to talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Sex is a vulnerable like topic, right? It is a tricky conversation. And even within marriage, the person that you are closest to, the person that you are the most connected to, it can open up space to become offended, to become um, just afraid even. Take of, it personally. Of, yes. And then even building up barriers now where it, you're meant to be so connected to be one flesh. Now you're separating each other from each other and creating a barrier instead. And I think it's important for us to prioritize that connection even by creating a safe space for each other to be able to express and to be able to have conversation about what is going on and about what it is that we're desiring or the things that we're even challenged with. And so having a conscientious, like proactive nature in conversations to not put shame on our partners is so important. And it can be so healing yeah. for our partners as well, because man, everyone wants to be good. Everyone wants to do things right. We're not trying to cause hurt to our partners. We're not trying to carry the baggage that we have. We're all broken in our own ways. And we're bringing that to the Lord. And at the same time, as our partners, as partners, we've got to encourage one another in that as well. That's right. We are unified mm -hmm. in our conversations and the things that we're working through. And even in our sexual desires, like we've got to be able to create a space for us to share those yep. things with each other too. Yeah, if there's shame in the sharing, you will never be able to create a solution to what is a problem. And so we want to always make sure that we have an open conversation about what's going on in the past so that we can be a solution to that problem. Because remember, your body has been given over to your spouse. So they have to be the solution. Now, I do want to address something because I think it's something that we often find with couples, especially Christian couples, where one person may be struggling with something, whether it's pornography or whatever, and the other person feels kind of powerless in that dynamic. What do I do? How do I become a solution? And I find it's either one of two directions. Either they move in the direction of, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to know about it because it's so hurtful. And if you bring it up, it just kind of explodes. That creates distance. Now they're going to hide from you because they can't share and be open and honest about what's going on. Or on the flip side, you become a doormat, right? Well, I'm just there to serve and submit to my husband or to love my wife. And I just got, you're not a doormat either. You are a partner in this thing. As a partner, you are there to hold your spouse accountable to the vows they made, to the scriptural standard that they set to. So you're not just, oh, I, you know, I can't do anything. You hold each other accountable to that. You set the standard. You're not just somebody that's walked upon for those things. But if we create a place of shame where every single time somebody's honest, it blows up with it, that's where we create secrets. That's where people start running. And so we can't do that. We have to create an open environment while still holding each other accountable to what it is that we're going after. And so there's got to be an openness. However, we've got to be working towards this together. I just feel like, man, there are people probably in this room that are struggling right now with this conversation, with what it is that we're talking about, because it is a challenge. Mm -hmm. And some of us, we know it's going to lead towards a fight immediately if this topic gets brought up or if something, you know, if, if we're actually honest about what's happened in the past, the things that have hurt each other in the past, sometimes counseling is important. That's right. Sometimes going to a Christian counselor or a therapist is important because there are some baggage things that you're carrying that need to be undone. Yeah. Sometimes it wasn't even your fault. 
but you've still got to work through it. That's right. Be there for each other, support one another in healing, and find a way to be able to come back to one. Yeah. Yeah, I want to say one last thing with this. You know, we had a men's group this past week, and we talked a little bit about this as men. You know, when you start to see yourself as the solution and not see some of the things that we talk about when it comes to discipline and fighting against the things that would hinder your intimacy in marriage um, as a get to and not a have to, it really changes the dynamic of why you do what you do. You know, when it comes to um, sometimes when we think about fantasies or attractions or desires that we have, we think that those are permanent. Your taste changes. You literally, anatomically, your taste buds can change. And I think sometimes we concrete what is fluid and what can change. And something that is really important for me, for us, when we talk to couples is you need to guard your attraction for your spouse. You might be saying, no, I'm not attracted to my spouse right now. Well, fight for it to get it back. Figure it out. What are you looking at? I saw a, t- I saw a, t- a statistic and I, I don't have the exact numbers, but it was something like, a young boy is going to see more beautiful women on the internet than most adult men living like 50 years ago would ever see in their lifetime. It is so challenging for you to safeguard your focus and your attraction for your spouse when you are scrolling for six hours a day looking at every other woman, every other object of your attraction. What do you think is going to happen? If you are not protecting and guarding your eyes for your spouse, Job says it like this, I have made a covenant with my eyes that I will not look lustfully at another woman in my life. You have to fight for that. And in this culture, it is a fight because it is everywhere. It is everywhere. And you know what I do on Instagram? I go on that. I, if something pops up on my Instagram, I go to that three little dots on the right hand, click on it, and it says not interested, and I click not interested. And that is my active way of saying, I am guarding my, my eyes. I am guarding what I see. You can't control what just pops up immediately, but you can control how long you stay there. How long are you going to stay there? What are you going to dwell upon? All right, so we've got a few more quick questions. We're going to call them quickies. Let's get, let's get these done really fast. All right, question number five okay. is how often should couples have sex? They should have sex often. Okay. okay, we'll go back to 1 Corinthians 7. It says, do not deprive one another. So you should be having sex often. Just a few things to think about when it comes to the amount of times you're having sex. Statistically, a sexless marriage is 10 times a year or less. So that would equate to about one or less times a month. Okay, we don't want to have sexless marriages. Statistically, those marriages end in divorce. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to, number one, we're going to be clear. We're going to communicate about our needs, how often, what we would desire, and we're going to come to a mutual agreement as to what that looks like. There's always going to be a high desire and a low desire in a marriage. Now, a low desire doesn't mean that person doesn't want to have sex. It just means they want to have sex less than the higher desire. You got to figure out and agree upon what that looks like. And listen, if you're a low desire because you haven't had really great sexual experiences yet, Don't count yourself out yet. You need to keep working at it. Get some really good experiences in there as you develop and do this process and realize you may be higher desire than you think you are. You just haven't had a great experience so so far. So be clear, be consistent and committed. Okay, so for some of us, life is crazy. It's busy. You got kids, you got work, you got stuff going on, and it's just the last thing on your list of things to do. And so some of you, you need to put it on the calendar. You need to schedule it. It is that important to your marriage that you have sex with your spouse. So be consistent, be committed, stick to it, and then lastly, have grace. Be flexible. Sometimes it's not going to happen when you plan for it. Sometimes something's going to get in the way. You have this great trip. Come on, how many married folks? You had this great trip planned out, and it was going to happen as you guys went away, and then you got into a fight, and it didn't happen. Just be flexible. Have grace. (laughs) It happens. It is what it is. Have makeup sex. Get over it. Move on. All right. Next question is, should we talk about sex? And if so, how? You should definitely be talking about sex in your marriage. And I remember when we first got married, it didn't happen immediately. I remember the exact moment, the exact place, 
of our first real conversation about sex yeah, in our you. relationship. Yeah. I didn't like that one. Yeah, I know, I know. And it was, and the reason why was because you didn't want to hurt my feelings. Mm -hmm. You had some feedback. Mm -hmm. You had some things that you wanted to let me know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it's true, like, the reason why we hold out on having real conversations about sex is because we love our partners mm -hmm. and we probably don't want to hurt them. Or we feel like it's, I mean, it's embarrassing to feel like you're going to get feedback or, you know, critique right. and you think you're killing the game and you are uh. not, you know? <laughs> Sometimes you say, this is awesome. And that person's like, this is not awesome. Stop it. I remember. And the reason why I bring it up is because I remember that day when he just said, can we just talk about this? And when he shared what he wanted to share, I kind of just, I didn't take offense to it. I actually responded, it's like, that's okay. I didn't realize that that bothered you or, you know, and maybe we were lucky in that sense that like whatever it was that he shared, it didn't, it didn't offend me. Mm -hmm. I, I fought to not become offended by that. Sure and did. I told him like, man, like, I'm so grateful you talked about this and it's okay. I, I affirmed him and I loved him back in the middle of that. And you know what that did? That set the standard. That actually really was a healing conversation for our marriage that set us up to be able to have healthy, consistent communication about sex. Because it's not just at the beginning. Right. It's throughout your entire journey, throughout your entire marriage, there are going to be issues. There are going to be things that changes. you're going to encounter. Changes mm -hmm. that you're going to encounter. And it's important to have touch base conversations on how things are going, what's working and what's not working. Now pause so, on that for a second. Mm -hmm. Women tend to be a little bit better at that than men do because I feel like we are, we can take things really personally. Men, like we're, we want to be strong. We want to put on a good front. We want to perform. And if I could just encourage you men for a second, um, just because you're getting feedback doesn't mean it's a character assassination, okay? It doesn't define you as an entire person, human being, okay? This is just a moment of conversation. And sometimes you have to fight to not be offended means you need to let it go. Like I know you may be at first or it may be uncomfortable, but you have to fight through that because if you don't, she will never feel like she can come to you for anything. And that, I'll tell you what, what rips relationships apart more than anything is that right there. Is this, I know how he's going to respond, so I'm not even going to bring it up. And you know what that does? It builds trenches of bitterness and resentment and unspoken issues that eventually will blow up in your face and it will cause separation. And then you wonder what, like, what is going on here? And it's because you weren't safe enough to talk to. So you got to let some of that go and be open to some of that feedback. I remember the other week when we were talking about healthy communication and the fact that like some people think when you're not talking about things is when things are good, but that is not the case. Right. We know that we should have, we should be having conversations about this, and we both have to agree that that is something we're going to prioritize. Mm -hmm. And having that set like standard allows us then to open up space for our partners to bring something to the table and for us to be prepared to have those conversations right. as well. And it's not always the bad stuff. Yeah, I mean, it, with just as much feedback critical feedback. There should be five times good feedback. That's right, baby. Come on, affirm them. Tell them what they're doing good. Tell That's them how right. they look. Make sure they feel good about it so that the conversation doesn't always have a negative connotation. Right. A few tangible things on how to have these healthy um, conversations. First thing is, if you are the one who wants to have that conversation, prepare your partner. Don't blindside them. Like, mm -hmm. do not do it in the middle Please of the deed. Do, do not just say, we need to have the conversation about this right now. Like, that's not going to work, okay? It will not work right afterward either. Set them up to be prepared and to ease them so that they don't come in defensive already. Mm -hmm. um, speak sensitively, yet truthfully. Ephesians 4.15, it says, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. The fact is, yes, we need to be sensitive in the way that we say things. We should never be tearing our partners down. We should never be saying anything that's going to make our partners feel like... like Embarrassed. It, yeah, mocked. embarrassed. But at the same time, it is so important to be truthful about what you like and what you don't like, what works and what doesn't work. And so because of that, let's be intentional about being truthful yet sensitive. And then, of course, listen. 
if you are that person who's being confronted about something or you know you're you weren't the person to decide even if you were the person to decide to start the conversation or you know to start it listening is so important in this and james 1 19 it says my dear brothers and sisters take note of this everyone should be quick to listen slow to speak and slow to become angry it is so vital to remember that listening is a vital part in building a strong connection and it will produce something that is going to be excellent love and long deeply is my last thing and what i mean by that is ultimately i will tell you the truth every time we have a conversation about sex you know how it ends with sex it is awesome and the reason why is because we've gone there <laughs> let's go that's a w right there uh, we open up space to kind of be vulnerable and then from there we fight to get to that place where now we're on the same page mm -hmm. and usually that moment is probably going to be a really really good moment That's great. ultimately the goal is a shared sexual satisfaction for both parties yeah uh real quick final questions how um Sorry, I lost my place here. Here we go. What's off limits and what's allowed? Uh, back to Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. So healthy sexual experiences push you towards each other. So when we're talking about what's allowed and what's off limits within a Christian marriage, there's not a lot of boundary lines except for that it needs to exist between the two of you. So other people, that's off limits. Pornography, where you're lusting after other people, off limits. Unconsented activity, off limits, right? Where it's not mutually agreed upon. But if it's pushing you towards each other, whatever it is, go read Song of Solomon. There's a lot of, I mean, I know it's old school and it's like written like fruits and fawns and all this kind of stuff, but it's really, really sexually graphic when you study what it actually means. And it's basically like, y'all have fun. Do whatever you want to do. As long as you both consent and it's between the two of you, go for it because the marriage bed is holy. Somebody say amen to that. That's a good word. Final question. What should men and women know about sex? So why don't you speak to the women first and then I'll, I'll end out. Ladies, confidence is key. And I mean, some of you are like, I know I am confident in what I've got to offer, okay? And that's great, that's great. There are some people who are not, okay? Some people are really struggling with feeling loved and feeling embraced and feeling like this is going to be enjoyable. Find confidence first when it comes to your personal stuff. And this has nothing to do oftentimes with your spouse. When it comes to the personal things of you not feeling valuable enough, worthy enough, beautiful enough, you've got to find your identity in Christ. You've got to find your love in Christ. Because again, if not, you're just going to be on this trail that's never ending of just trying to seek for the satisfaction in this emptiness of your heart that can only be satisfied by Christ. And at the same time, though, when we are confident in ourselves, in the beauty that God created us in, man, that is so attractive to our partners. When we can be confident in our relationships and just in who we are, that is the most, um, I think, like the most important standard to start with in order to experience great sex with our partners. That's right. And I think we, as spouses, we create a space for that, right? If there is constant comparison or we're bringing other things into the dynamic, then it's really difficult to feel confident in yourself because you're trying to live up to some other image or ideal. But when we fully commit to, I'm into you, you are the standard for me, that breeds confidence, that brings out the best in people. And so um, as the worship team comes up, I wanna close just speaking to the men for a second. You know, there's a lot of pressure on you not, not like there's not a lot of pressure on women here, but speaking to the men specifically, I think there is this challenge for us sometimes to feel this need to be in control, to perform, to show up, to have it all under control, have it all you know, presented strong. And I think one of the most intimate ways you can engage with your spouse is to let go and to be vulnerable and to be open and to allow your spouse the power and the influence to affect you deeply. This is something that we don't often see as a form of love because we think love is you know, providing for other people, giving for other people, but sometimes a great way to love your spouse is to let them love you. And your walls and your guards and your need to be in control at all times 
is communicating something to your spouse that you don't trust them enough to let go. You don't trust them enough to be completely vulnerable and yourself. Sex is vulnerable. And for you to let go in that moment may be the very thing that your spouse is so longing for because it would communicate to them that you trust them enough to care for you, to love you, to please you, to serve you. And I think that's hard for us because when we do that, we feel exposed. We feel maybe even sometimes weak. But it's in that place that you actually become stronger in your relationship with the person that you're with because it's not just on you, now it's a partnership. And for some of you, the very thing that you're longing for in your marriage and you're looking somewhere else for, would happen if you would just let go and let your spouse really love you. And so men lead by example. Open up, be vulnerable, be honest. Not just transparent, be vulnerable. Vulnerability is allowing somebody else to affect you deeply. When we do this, we communicate in openness and trust. That's where intimacy is formed. And that's where great sex really exists. Was this helpful for anybody here today? Awesome.